This audiobook contains scenes, language, and subject matters unsuitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Chapter 6 I watched the time-lapse that Casey provided with a fresh cup of coffee and two slices of buttered toast. The sun rose from the east, tenderly kissing the coastal rocks as it banished the darkness of the previous night. The sky transformed with rich gradients of oranges, reds, and yellows as the clouds raced from one horizon to another. Within seconds, the great ball of light sank behind the western hills, departing from the dimming sky and allowing the shroud of night to return. This event occurred seven times a week, four weeks a month, twelve months a year, and throughout all those twenty years I slept. The village had grown over the two decades, with new tents and huts expanding onto the white sands of the beach. As I crossed into the main square with Casey in tow, I saw many new faces before realizing they were not new. They were faces I had last seen as children, who were now fully grown adults. The adults who were previously young were now wrinkled and gray, while those who were once wrinkled and gray were no longer amongst them. I myself remained the same age, 32, the same age I had been when I left the old world. When I entered the tent, the first thing I noticed was the white drapes. Backlit by the soft morning sun, the images of the butterflies were no longer in stark black, but a multitude of colors. The village artists had mastered new inks and dyes in my absence. I prepared to comment on the new art to Elena Six when I stopped. Seated on the large pillow was a figure, but not the one I had expected. Who are you? I demanded. The young man wore a plain white attire with a silver crown on his head. I looked around for any sign of Elena Six, but he was alone. What are you doing in here? I didn't try to hide my temper. The young man was taken aback, unsure of what he was meant to do. Who are you? I pressed, now fearing he may have done something to her. I am Elleen Krada, the twenty-year-old replied. I slowly moved closer and began to see it. The features were there, particularly in his eyes and cheekbones. Elena Five did have a child. She had a son. Do not be alarmed, a log from my past self said, addressing the inevitable situation I found myself in. There is always a 50-50 chance of male or female. I looked up at the wall screen, already cross-referencing the face of Elena Six, or rather, Am Aline, with the appropriate female matches for an Elena Seven. The process can continue. Nothing changes. I didn't know how many more times I could bring myself to play this game, but one thing was certain. I had to try at least once more. I had to see her face at least once more. After that, I'd stop. I knocked back a shot of tequila, the fiery liquid burning its path down my throat. Before the glass could even touch the bar again, an automated waiter bot was at the ready, pouring another. I squeezed the bridge of my nose between my fingers. I'm losing it, I muttered to myself. I've completely lost it. Psychological counseling is available for all priority passengers, Casey's voice echoed around me. All right, I scoffed bitterly, my grip on the glass tightening. I'm on a remote island millions of years in the future, selectively breeding my deceased girlfriend in the hopes that one day she will look exactly like her and fall head over heels in love with me. Tell me, what advice would you give for that? There was a pause, longer than I was used to from Casey. I am afraid I lack the data to assist with such a unique circumstance. I was about to throw back the next shot when something held me back. An idea, slowly crystallizing. I stared at the small glass, the liquid inside shimmering in the dim lighting of the empty, lonely bar. Data, I murmured, the gears in my head turning. Casey, I need you to do something. The white sand beach stretched across my wall screen, bathed in sunlight, and right in the center, the first ever school lesson on New Earth was taking place. A vibrant, holographic apple hovered in the air, capturing the children's unwavering attention. App, pal. 
Casey's voice articulated as her orb hovered before them, emphasizing each syllable. The eager voices of the children echoed in near unison. Apal. The projection seamlessly transitioned to an image of a flower with animated petals opening. Casey continued her instruction. Flower. Without hesitation, the children responded, Flower. The adult villagers held back, unsure of what was taking place, but allowing whatever it was Kra Da asked of them. I couldn't help but smile as the children, the next generation, were learning. In 20 years, how much would change? How much more would I be able to communicate with them and with the next Amelina, who has already been conceived? Late into the night, the live footage ran on the screen. I sat, captivated. The children were gathered with the adults around a fire, all excitedly sharing all they had learned from Krada's magical companion that day, or at the very least, all that they could remember. Any abrupt change in their natural development is not advisable, Casey's voice came from the general speakers, less a warning and more a statement. I am helping them learn to speak, I challenged. How is that a bad thing? Should one village grow more intelligent than another, tribal conflict may follow. Then teach them all. Tell them if they start acting like savages, Krada will send a lightning bolt from the sky or something. As, As you, you wish, wish, sir, Casey responded. Just remember, she's the priority. I'm talking one-to-one -one tutoring every day as soon as she starts talking. Understood? Understood, sir. I sighed, deactivating the screen. Assuming it is a she this time. I stood and reached for my stasis overalls. It had been a long week for the great Krata. It was time for bed. Chapter 7 A Hundred and Forty Years After the Incident The rhythmic sound of the waves accompanied me as I made my way across the beach. I glanced at the two rolling service bots beside me, bearing the usual gifts. Clothes, shoes, small utensils, and cutlery. I considered offering the elders a sample of the abundant alcohol stored within the enormous sub-level supply vaults of the cradle. It was highly unlikely I would consume all the wines, beers, and spirits in my lifetime, and it might provide the elders with a little comfort in their often short twilight years. However, I quickly concluded that introducing such an addictive temptation was a can of worms best left unopened. Still, if things went according to plan, perhaps they would soon learn to craft their own beverages of a similar nature on their own accord. Upon my arrival, I was greeted with a familiar yet different chant. Hi. I stopped and turned to Casey, asking, are they saying hi? That would be hi, she clarified, as in great. I found myself smiling. It was working. They were expanding their vocabulary. As I headed to the tent, a familiar face caught my attention. It was Am Aileen, now 40, showing visible signs of age. I pondered whether he still remembered our encounter from all those years ago, our only direct interaction. His respectful bow suggested it hadn't left a negative impression. After fulfilling his duty, his life seemed to have been fruitful. A village woman of a similar age stood by his side, and surrounding them were their seven children. The tallest, likely nearing the end of his teenage years, stood out. While all the children bore features of both parents, None resembled Elena or the mute grandmother, the chicken devouring Elena V. Their presence was a stark reminder of nature's relentlessness and indifference in erasing traces of the past. As I approached the white tent and the young female villagers kneeling on either side of me fell silent, I braced myself, hoping for the best but prepared for the worst. All right, let's see what the stork has brought us. She wore the same golden tiara, but was adorned in a different white wedding dress, one I had donated before entering my previous stasis. In the cradle storage, there were several wedding dresses, likely a result of a peculiar preference one of the priorities had. 
The dress was in pristine condition, meticulously set aside by the elders and preserved for the past 20 years. It had been saved specifically for this day, the day of her 20th year as Amelina. I prepared to greet her, but to my surprise, she spoke first. Welcome, Hai Krada. I stopped. Her voice was quiet and soft, but perfectly clear. What did you say? I managed, my voice barely a whisper. She raised her hands and, without waiting for my request, drew back her veil. Her blue eyes, pushing through her nerves, met mine. Amelina, welcomes High Krata. A chill ran through me, but unlike pastimes, this sensation transformed, warming, expanding, and enveloping every fiber of my being. She wasn't merely repeating words she didn't comprehend. She was genuinely addressing me. I approached her, my gaze fixed. I don't know if it was my imagination or the weight of the moment, but beyond her blue eyes and light wavy blonde hair, she seemed completely identical. Identical to Elena. She noticed my tears before I even felt them forming. Hi, Krada, not happy? She inquired with concern. Another surge of warmth flowed through me. Even her voice now began to sound familiar. No, I smiled, releasing more tears. I am happy. I am so very happy to meet you. She gave a small trained smile, then nodded. I too am happy to meet you. I pressed my forehead against hers. Again, I couldn't be sure, but she now also smelled familiar. Overwhelmed, my eyes met hers as I held her face gently in my hands. No more games. I'm not putting you through this ever again. It's you and me. Do you understand? Just you and me. You and me, she echoed, not shrinking from my touch. I took both her hands in mine, planting a tender kiss on her fingers. It was finally over. I could finally move on with my life. With her by my side. Elena Seven stepped into the suite with mild hesitance. As it had been for her grandmother, who had passed before her birth, Everything in the cradle was unlike anything she had ever seen before or could ever have imagined. I watched as she slowly turned, her wide eyes taking in the alien devices on the walls and tables. This is yours, I said, gesturing to the large room. All of this, it's all yours, your room. She looked at me, attempting to process. Room? She repeated slowly. I nodded enthusiastically. Yes, room, home. This is your home, your bed, your bathroom. Everything in here belongs to you. I glimpsed her unease and could hardly blame her. She knew of only one home and now suddenly her entire world had been turned upside down. My room is outside, I said, attempting to reassure and perhaps distract her. I'll never be far away. She looked at me, her eyes searching for clarity. Amelina, stay in room? No, no, I responded, not wanting her to feel confined. You don't have to stay in here at all. You can go anywhere you want. Look. I quickly turned to the door and waved my hand over the sensor. The door instantly slid open, revealing the empty carpeted hallway outside. I saw her expression transform from confusion to amazement, a small smile that warmed me. Hi, Krada. Magic, she whispered in awe. It's not magic, I explained with friendly amusement. You can do it too, just wave your hand. She hesitated, taking a slow step forward, then emulated my gesture. The door responded, sliding open and shut as she repeated the motion. Another smile lit up her face, one of childlike wonder. If you need anything, food, clothes, just call for Casey, I continued. Her full attention returned to me as she looked puzzled. Casey, hi, Krada. Oh, no, no, I'm not Casey. Casey is... I paused, realizing explaining Casey would be far too complex at this stage. It's okay, I smiled. We'll take this one day at a time. She half nodded, a hint of the unease returning. Rest, I suggested. Casey will bring some new clothes. You can pick out whatever you like, your choice. I reached out and touched her hand, trying to reassure her. You'll be happy here, I promise. Amelina, happy with Krada, she responded. Whether she fully meant it or not, I wasn't certain. It didn't matter. Even if she wasn't now... I would dedicate the rest of my life to ensuring she was. I turned and left the room, the door sliding shut behind me.
My fingers danced over the piano keys, drawing out a gentle, tender, romantic piece from memory. I remembered the artist's name, Chopin. The piece was a nocturne, followed by some number, perhaps. Hi, Krada Magic, a voice whispered behind me, filled with awe. I turned, unaware she had entered the lounge, and was further caught off guard by her Cinderella-like transformation. She wore a shimmering gold evening dress. Her long, wavy blonde hair had been straightened, framing a face expertly made up, likely with the aid of the service bots. The recommended heels were not to the lady's satisfaction, Casey commented, hovering by the entrance to the lounge. I noticed Elena Seven was wearing bathroom slippers that, while comfortable, conflicted with the elegance of the evening dress. Dismissing Casey, my attention remained on Elena Seven. That's a lovely choice. Very shiny, I complimented. She touched the reflective fabric, a small smile playing on her lips. Shiny, she echoed. By some strange coincidence, much like her grandmother, she was drawn to the piano. As before, I offered a brief explanation. It's a piano for playing music. You tap the keys like this. As I demonstrated, her curiosity seemed to deepen. Here, I said, moving to her side, encouraging her to give it a try. She sat down on the stool, and with each key she pressed, her delight became more evident. Drawing another chair, I sat beside her, playing a simple, recognizable melody, at least recognizable to anyone from the old world. She listened with rapt attention. Sound familiar? She shook her head, her gaze still on the piano. Right, of course, sorry, I apologized, momentarily forgetting the many millions of years that separated her from the old world. She hesitated, then tentatively touched the keys again, her fingers tracing the polished surface. Beautiful, she said softly and slowly, perhaps to herself. I could sense her fascination as she tried to comprehend how the instrument functioned. I can teach you one day, I proposed. Would you like that? Her eyes met mine and she smiled with gratitude. Yes, Hycrata, teach Amelina. She delicately held the hamburger. There was a slight awkwardness in her movement. She was uncertain if what she was doing was correct and did not want to offend me. Hold it with both hands, I instructed, like this. It keeps everything from falling out. She followed my guidance, cautiously taking a bite. You like it? I asked. She answered with a smile as she chewed. Yes, like. Good. I smiled back, relieved to see her enjoying something else within the cradle. She looked down at her burger with a curious tilt of her head. What meat? It's beef from a cow, I explained. Cow? She echoed, unfamiliar with the term. I guess they don't have those here. Or maybe they're on another part of the planet. Planet. It's all right. I smiled again. Forget I said that. I poured her some juice. Just enjoy. These could be the last hamburger patties in the entire universe. She took another small bite, chewing thoughtfully. Am Alina like high crowd food? I set down my own burger and leaned forward with warm assurance. You can have as much as you like. Whenever you like. You understand? I am Alina, understand, she nodded, offering another small smile. And by the way, I said, returning to my own burger, it's not am Alina, just Elena. Alina, she repeated, sipping her juice before taking another bite. No, it's Elena, I corrected. Alnaya, she tried again. No, say it right, I snapped. She recoiled, almost dropping her burger. Regret gripped me instantly. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have... I gathered myself, smiling quickly. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how you pronounce it. The fact that you're here with me, that's all that matters. I quickly tried to distract her, placing more fries on her plate. Please, eat. She slowly reached forward, taking a single French fry. I felt another pang of guilt, but was confident I hadn't caused any lasting damage. She'll forget about it by tomorrow. The door slid open and Elena Seven slowly stepped into her suite, casting a glance behind as if seeking affirmation. Is it all right if I come in? I asked, 
holding in the hallway. She turned to me, her expression slightly confused. This, High Krata home. No, it's your home, I reminded her. I won't ever enter without your permission. I saw the realization dawn on her. She had a choice, perhaps something she had never experienced in her life. With a gentle voice, I asked, Am Alina's home. May I enter? She gave a slight nod. Stepping in, the door closed behind me. She stood motionless. Trying to initiate a conversation, I said, The bed, do you like it? I guess this is the first time for you. First time? Sleeping in a bed, I quickly clarified. She glanced at the large bed, then back to me. Hi, Krada, sleep with Amelina? She asked. No, no, that's not what I meant. She fell quiet, her gaze searching me. Why take Amelina new home? I stopped and looked at her. Once again, it was so strange to be addressed by her so directly. Why did I take you from the village? She lightly nodded. I hesitated, trying to find the right words, but it really wasn't that complicated. I want you to be happy. I want you to be safe. Am Alina not safe in village? She asked with genuine curiosity. You will like it here, I reassured her. You will be happy here. I reached out and gently took her hand. Please be happy, I whispered, my voice carrying a hint of desperation. She slowly looked at me. Our faces were just inches apart. Instinctively, I brushed a lock of her blonde hair behind her ear. In the dim light of the suite and the looming of my shadow, her hair took on a darker shade, almost appearing black. Can I kiss you? I finally asked. What is kiss? She looked puzzled. A kiss is a sign, I tried to explain. It tells you things that cannot be spoken. A kiss is magic? I smiled softly. Yes, in a way it's a kind of magic. She paused for a moment, then quietly gave her permission. Kiss. Amelina. I leaned in, feeling the warmth of her breath on my face. My lips met hers tentatively, but she remained still, unresponsive. Logic told me she didn't know how to react, that this was her first kiss. But my heart told me the truth. You don't feel anything. Her eyes shifted, avoiding my gaze. What Amelina do? For High Krata? Whatever you want, I replied earnestly. Whatever you choose. Whatever you feel. I placed my hand over her heart. In here. She looked at my hand on her chest, and after a few moments of silence, she said, Hi Krada, Amelina, Prokrat, her tone a mix of consent and obedience. She reached back and began to unfasten her dress. Wait, I immediately stopped her. Is this what you want? My voice wavered. She met my gaze and spoke with solemn duty. Amelina born for Prokrat. My purpose. She lowered the top of her gold dress and stood exposed before me. In my mind, Elena spun and danced with playful laughter, covering herself with only her arm. Elena Seven looked away and waited. I smiled from the white sheets as Elena approached, her own smile radiating brightly as she lowered her arm for the man she loved. I gently touched Elena Seven's breast. The touch was not driven by any carnal desire, for I felt none. It was instead driven by a curiosity and a bittersweet resignation, for the only words I uttered were, hers were smaller. I backed away and averted my eyes. Get some sleep. In the morning, I'll take you back. As I left, I thought I heard a faint exhale of relief from her, but I couldn't be certain. I wandered alone in the stasis chamber, surrounded by the 230 empty coffins. My finger ran over the side of one, feeling its cold, hard surface. Perhaps the pod once belonged to Bobby Boy, or maybe even Elena herself. One of them must have been hers. As I turned to survey the vast room, the damaged wall screen caught my eye. Two prominent spiderweb cracks marred its surface, one at the base and another almost squarely in the middle. Such damage must have been the result of significant force. It couldn't have originated internally, which only meant... 
Stop! Stop! I screamed in a wild frenzy, pounding the stool as hard as I could, attempting to obliterate the haunting image on display. Stop it! The broken, flickering apparition on the towering screen grinned back at me, cold and vindictive, reveling in my torment. This was the face that would rob me of her, both physically and mentally. The face that would take everything from me. Please stop! A gentle touch on my shoulder jolted me from the nightmare. Hi, Krata? Elena Seven leaned down. In a knee-jerk reaction, I screamed, Stop! Swinging my arm with abandon, my fist struck her, propelling her small frame into the guardrail. Oh God, Elena. I gasped as she shakily rose, her hand tenderly cradling her reddened cheek. Shaken fear danced in her hazel, no blue eyes. As I tried to reach out to her, she instinctively recoiled, almost tumbling down the stairs. Regaining her composure, her voice trembled more from shame than the physical pain. Forgive me. Cassie say hi Krada here. Casey's floating orb rose, awaiting instruction. As I pulled myself to my feet, I tried and failed to look at her face. A face that so closely resembled Elena's and was now fearful of mine. Open the main doors, I ordered Casey, my back turned to them both. Make sure she gets back to the village safely. As you wish, Casey responded, moving towards an opening set of doors. As she left, the sound was unmistakable this time. The quiet exhale of relief. Cradle, written by Mahul Desai, based on an original feature film screenplay by Mahul Desai. This novella has been AI-assisted. All scenes, characters, situations, and dialogue have been taken from the original feature film screenplay. WGA West Registry, 247147. Music licensed from Pond 5. Special sound effects by Serban Matai. For more information, email intothecradle at gmail.com.